Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Results of the Climate Change Vulnerability Assessment and Adaptation Strategies for Focal Resources of the Sierra Nevada. My name is Whitney Rainier, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Before we get started, I want to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We have two hours scheduled for this webinar, which will be divided up into two parts. First, we'll have a presentation by Chrissy Howell a regional wildlife ecologist for the U.S. Forest Service Pacific Southwest region, and Jesse Kirshner, a lead scientist with EcoAdapt. Following the presentation, we will hold an office hour, during which participants can ask questions about the presentation or project, make re recommendations about next steps, or talk with the speakers about specific issues on their forest. This webinar is intended for U.S. Forest Service staff who are unable to participate in either the January U.S. Forest Service Climate Change Integration Team webinar or the February California LCC webinar. It is meant to introduce U.S. Forest Service staff to the vulnerability assessment adaptation strategy process and product so that they can be used in their management and planning efforts. You may submit questions or comments in writing during this presentation. We'll be reviewing them as they come in and we'll address them following the presentation. We would prefer if participants submit written questions so we have less background noise and interference from unmuting. Today's webinar is being recorded, and everyone will receive an email with a link to view a recording of today's event, as well as a PDF version of the presentation. We will also post the recording on the EcoAdapt website. Thank you, and enjoy the webinar. Chrissy, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Um, and I'd just like to add that um, even if you attended the January or February webinar, we'll be providing more information on how to actually apply the information, so um, it's, it's not a complete repeat. Um, and, uh, you know, so just wanted to let folks know that. So, yeah, that today um, we'll be giving this webinar, and um, I'm starting things off, but um, quite uh, the bulk of this work um, was done in partnership with EcoAdapt, um, and I'm really happy today to have Jesse Kirshner available from EcoAdapt to participate in this webinar as she's been um, involved throughout the entire process. And we will be talking about the Climate Change Vulnerability Assessment and Adaptation Project in the Sierra Nevada. This project also has implications outside of the Sierra Nevada, and we'll talk about that as well. If I could have the next slide. The way that we will be presenting things today, we'll give um, the project history, need, and process, um, and then we'll go into the vulnerability assessment, and then the adaptation planning that followed from that. Um, we'll be going over the climate-informed mapping that was part of the overall process, and then the broader impacts and application. Um, and then, as Whitney said, we'll be opening it up to questions, and um, both questions about the presentation as well as questions you might have specifically about issues on your forest um, and how to integrate climate change considerations into the work that you're doing. So next slide. The project history, um, this project, started in 2010, if not earlier, which actually predates my involvement with the Forest Service. Um, Diana Craig and Bruce Goines sought input from stakeholders, from forests and partners, on conducting a climate change vulnerability assessment. And a number of stakeholders were very interested in being involved and had a lot of input. And EcoAdapt and partners submitted a grant proposal in 2012 to the California LCC. And you'll hear us mention California LCC multiple times today. That's the California Landscape Conservation Cooperative. And that was to conduct a vulnerability assessment and develop adaptation strategies for focal resources in the Sierra Nevada. And in fall 2012, that was funded. So most of this work has been funded by an outside entity, the California LCC. And they provided that funding to EcoAdapt to work together with the Forest Service. So it's, it's been a, a huge partnership project. And we feel really fortunate the way the funding worked out and also um, not just the funding, but the, the partnership opportunities that have arisen out of this, especially having a project that um, involves the California LCC. So next slide. When this project originated, um, you know, thinking about the project need, there were, um, we have a climate scorecard um, throughout the United States, and so within each region we score how we're doing on these 10 different elements. 
and one, uh, one of the elements has to do with assessing vulnerability, that's um, element six, and another has to do with adaptation actions on the forest, that's element seven. Um, so that was one need behind this project was trying to get to yes on those two um, scorecard elements as well as um, internal and external interest in including climate change as part of forest plan revision, just in general to facilitate stakeholder input and to generally tap into outside expertise. So on many different levels, it looks like this sort of project would be really useful and needed and beneficial to all of us in the Forest Service. Next slide. So. I've already alluded to the California LTC, the California Landscape Conservation Cooperative. There in green, you can see the boundaries of the LCC. Um, so it's most of California, but not all of it. Um, there's also a North Pacific LCC directly to the north, a Great Basin LTC to the northeast, um, and a desert LCC. Um, but most of the Forest Service lands are, are within this California LCC. And it's a management science partnership that facilitates complex multi-sector sector conservations about prioritizing limited resources under rapidly changing ecological conditions. Um, and it's just been a great forum for working, moving forward on integrating climate change into projects and management decisions. And we were very fortunate that EcoAdapt was interested in being involved with us in this project. Um, and next slide, I'll turn it over to Jessie, and she will tell us a little bit more about EcoAdapt, her organization. Thanks, Christy. Hi, everybody. This is Jessie Kirshner. I'm a lead scientist with EcoAdapt. Um, but before I go into details about this Sierra Nevada project, I thought it would be helpful to provide a little bit of context about EcoAdapt, um, since we're a relatively new organization. Um, we are a nonprofit. We were founded in 2008, and we're based in Washington State, and we focus exclusively on climate change adaptation. Uh, we are dedicated to helping resource managers and conservation planners adapt to the impacts of climate change, and we specifically provide support, training, and assistance to help make planning and management less vulnerable and more climate-informed, and we do this through our four main programs. Our first two programs, the State of Adaptation and the Climate Adaptation Knowledge Exchange, are really aimed at understanding what kinds of adaptation activities are occurring um, and then connecting adaptation practitioners with one another. So we do this through um, surveying adaptation practitioners across North America um, in order to write case studies so that we can generate some lessons learned, um, some ideas of where people are getting funding, um, what kinds of methods they're undertaking, uh, and so we have these case studies that are um, part of our state of adaptation reports or put on the Climate Adaptation Knowledge Exchange or CAKE website. The CAKE website is a free online resource if you're not familiar with it. Um, it has hundreds of different case studies about adaptation activities. Uh, it has a virtual library which has different management and planning documents around climate change adaptation. It has a tool section with different um, tools related to vulnerability assessments or monitoring frameworks or adaptation plans. Um, and then a directory of individuals and organizations that are interested in or engaged in adaptation. So if you haven't checked out that website, I'd highly um, encourage you to do so. Our second two programs, our Awareness to Action and our Adaptation Consultation programs, are really aimed at supporting our partners in adaptation planning. So um, this could be through helping them to do a vulnerability assessment. It could be through developing adaptation plans or developing a monitoring framework. Um, really, we just work with our partners um, to help them at different phases and to move them from awareness about climate change impacts to actual implementation of adaptation activities. Uh, so just wanted to provide everybody um, on the webinar with an overview of the project. Um, the audience for this project is primarily land and resource managers in the Sierra Nevada. Um, the scope of this project was for the entire Sierra Nevada, but we did break it up into three different geographic ecoregions, a north, a central, and a south. The north ecoregion includes the Modoc, Lassen, and Plumas National Forests. The central ecoregion includes the Tahoe, El Dorado, and Stanislaus National Forests, the Lake Tahoe Basin Management Unit, and Yosemite National Park. 
And then the southern ecoregion includes the Humboldt, Toyabe, Sierra, Sequoia, and Inyo National Forest, and Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park. So as part of this project, we assess the vulnerability of a number of ecosystem species and ecosystem services to both climate and non-climate stressors. And we developed adaptation strategies for a smaller number of ecosystems and species. Uh, we'll be presenting the ecosystem services that we looked at, um, but we won't go into any detail as part of this presentation. So if you have questions, you can email either me or Christy later, and we can tell you more about the ecosystem services. Um, so the process that we undertook was really comprised of these four main steps. So the first step was to identify the focal resources that we wanted to consider as part of this project. So what ecosystem species and ecosystem services did we want to consider? Uh, and then to gather um, relevant background data and information on those focal resources. The second step was to assess the different components of vulnerability during a vulnerability assessment workshop. The third was to then synthesize that vulnerability assessment information. And then following that synthesis, apply the assessment results and adaptation planning during an adaptation workshop. So I'm going to focus, or actually I'm going to turn it back over to Chrissy right now to talk about how we selected um, our focal resources. Thanks, Jesse. As I mentioned earlier, we had various stakeholder groups that were involved before this project um, even got off the ground. And those different groups would come up with different lists of species. And the question came up of whether to focus on species or ecosystems or ecosystem services. The list ranged from five to 65 resources. And it was unlikely that with the funding that we had um, that we could cover everything. So we solicited further feedback from these various stakeholders on how to do the groupings. And one thing that we found was that while the species list varied, we were coming up, different groups were coming up with similar lists for, for ecosystems. And so, next slide. Um, so that's what um, we focused on, was coming up with um, basically coarse filter versus a fine filter approach in, in selecting lists. Um, so the, the species is the fine filter, and the ecosystems were the coarse filter. And we also had a process where we um, basically, it was a continuous iteration of trying to refine these species lists and soliciting input on whether people and experts thought that the, the organism that they perhaps felt most strongly about as a, as a conservation group, whether attributes of that species were captured by the course filter or not. So there was a lot of input with the stakeholders going back and forth with that. And ultimately, we came up with the um, next slide, this is the um, final list of focal resources. So on the far left column, you can see the course filter of the ecosystem. So alpine, subalpine, yellow pine mixed conifer, wet meadows, red fir, oak woodlands, chaparral, sagebrush, aquatic. And then within each of those fine filters or specific species that were addressed included bristlecone pine, white bark pine, bighorn sheep, Fisher under yellow pine, willow flycatcher and aspen under wet meadows, red fir and martin under the red fir coarse filter, blue oak and black oak under oak woodlands, wood rat and mountain quail under chaparral, sage grouse under sagebrush, and then the two yellow-legged frogs under aquatic. So ultimately, that was the list that we used to move forward with um, in doing the um, next two steps of the process that Jesse will talk about. So I'll turn it back over to Jesse. Thanks, Chrissy. All right, so we're going to talk um, more specifically about um, the vulnerability assessment process that we undertook. Uh, before I get into those details, I did just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page about um, why you conduct a vulnerability assessment and what the different components are. So the purpose of conducting a vulnerability assessment is to help to identify what resources are most vulnerable and why. And why is really important because it helps you to identify the kinds of adaptation strategies that you might take to reduce vulnerabilities. Um, vulnerability assessments are comprised of three main components, exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. So sensitivity is a measure of how much a resource is likely to be affected by a given change in climate. Exposure is how much of a change in climate the resource is likely to experience. 
And adaptive capacity is the ability of the resource to cope with or respond to changes. So the goal of this particular vulnerability assessment was to evaluate the vulnerability of selected resources to climate and non-climate stressors using a combination of literature review, spatial climate information, and expert input. The process that we undertook was comprised of these four main steps, um, which mirror the figure on the right. Um, the first step was to collect background information on the focal resources, um, and this was done by three different groups. The GEOS Institute compiled um, downscale spatial climate information. So they created a series of tables and maps for the Sierra Nevada region, um, which included downscale projections for temperature, precipitation, um, wildfire, vegetation change, um, and a number of hydrologic variables. Um, TACMO, or the template for assessing climate change impacts and management options, provided um, summarized peer review literature on exposure for the different focal resources, and then EcoAdapt summarized the literature for sensitivity and adaptive capacity for the different focal resources. So those background packets were compiled prior to this expert elicitation vulnerability assessment workshop, which was held in March of 2013. During that workshop, participants evaluated the sensitivity, adaptive capacity, and exposure variables for each resource. Following that workshop, we assembled and synthesized the information uh, into draft vulnerability assessment findings. So these findings included information from the workshop as well as from the peer review literature. Um, those findings were sent out for peer review from topic experts, um, most of whom did not participate in the workshop. Uh, and then we created these final vulnerability assessment findings. So I just wanted to provide a little bit more context and detail about what happens at a vulnerability assessment workshop and the one that we led. Um, the vulnerability assessment workshop included over 30 participants representing approximately 15 different agencies, NGOs, and environmental groups. And we had participants break out into area, break out into groups based on their area of expertise. Um, and within their breakout groups, they were asked to assess the different components of vulnerability. So specifically, they were asked to assess the sensitivity of a given resource. So that included um, considering both climate change and non-climate stressors, among other sensitivity factors, such as um, disturbance regimes. We also asked them to evaluate the adaptive capacity of a given resource. So um, for habitats or ecosystems, this included factors such as extent and fragmentation, um, habitat diversity in terms of topographical and physical diversity, as well as component species diversity. Um, and then for species, it included things like dispersal ability, um, plasticity, and evolutionary potential. Uh, and for both species and ecosystems, we asked participants to think about management potential. So what is the likelihood of um, management being able to um, alleviate climate impacts on that resource? The groups were also asked to identify climate exposure factors um, most relevant to consider for a given resource and then to evaluate exposure for each of the three um, here in Nevada subregions. So, Exposure was evaluated for the North, Central, and South subregions. Um, during the workshop, we had um, we were able to assess all of the focal resources that Chrissy presented um, on that earlier slide. Um, and then, following the small breakout group exercises, we reconvened everyone uh, and had a large group discussion where groups had an opportunity to share their findings. Um, and then, participants participants could ask questions. Um, about why um, particular factors were or were not considered as part of their assessment. Um, and then it was it provided a way to start to compare um, how resource vulnerabilities were falling out in relation to one another. So I wanted to present um, an example of the vulnerability assessment findings um, for the wet meadows ecosystem. This is um, obviously a simplified version of the information that's in our vulnerability assessment findings, but it does give you a sense of the kinds of information that was gathered during this assessment. So wet meadows were evaluated as being um, moderate to highly sensitive to climate and climate-driven changes, such as altered precipitation, decreased snowpack, and altered hydrology. Um, the sensitivities are really due to um, the fact that meadow distribution type and vegetation density are primarily determined by hydrology. So um, this makes meadows particularly sensitive to drying, which could be caused by reduced snowpack um, or things like erosion that result from extreme precipitation events. The sensitivities to non-climate stressors, um, wet meadows are evaluated as having high sensitivity to these non-climate stressors. 
Um, things that came out were water diversions, grazing, and recreational activities, and there's actually a couple others that were mentioned by the group that I didn't include here. Um, but these non-climate stressors can degrade the state of meadows and compound climate-driven changes. So for example, grazing and recreational activities um, that result in soil compaction um, can reduce water infiltration. So if we're already going to be experiencing less water supply in the future, um, these changes could be exacerbated um, through these non-climate activities. In terms of future climate exposure, um, what you expect came out is that changes in precipitation type, timing, and amount uh, that affect hydrologic regimes and soil moisture are really the ones that we need to be aware of and pay attention to for wet meadows. Um, the adaptive capacity for wet meadows was evaluated as being pretty good, so more moderate to high adaptive capacity. So for example, the component species diversity of wet meadows is thought to be quite high, um, but some of the things that contributed to more of the negative adapt adaptive capacity rating for wet meadows included their currently fragmented distribution within the Sierra Nevada and many of them existing in a degraded state. So now I want to take sort of a step back and think about how you might apply this kind of vulnerability assessment information and management decision making. Um, so this example that I've presented here uh, is in terms of the forest plan revision process um, and revising management objectives as part of, as part of that process. Um, so the management objective that I've written down here is from another forest plan outside of the Sierra Nevada, but I think it gives a good idea uh, of how you might use this vulnerability assessment information. So the current management objective is that within 10 years of forest plan approval, restore one groundwater dependent ecosystem that was damaged or degraded by previous management activities. So from things like abandoned mining or dredging. The potential vulnerabilities for that groundwater dependent ecosystem um, are that changes in snowpack or groundwater recharge may eliminate or significantly degrade some groundwater dependent ecosystems. And so as we think about where to restore we might want to think about restoring areas that are likely to have future water supply so that we're investing our money in places likely to succeed. So I just included that idea as um, a revised management objective where the beginning is the same. So within 10 years of forest plan approval, restore one groundwater dependent ecosystem that was damaged or degraded by previous management activities and is likely to retain water supply in the future given projected climate changes. So just as a way to think about incorporating best available science now um, into these objectives so that we are potentially investing um, restoration dollars and activities in places that are likely to succeed in the future um, given these potential changes in water supply. So now that I've presented an example for a single resource, uh, I wanted to provide folks with an idea of the vulnerability assessment results across ecosystems and then across species. So um, we'll start with ecosystems, and just to quickly orient you to this figure, we're going to start in the upper right. Um, and if you look along the x-axis along the top there, we have sensitivity and climate exposure. So as you move from left to right, you move from low sensitivity and exposure to high sensitivity and exposure. And then on the y-axis, as you move from bottom to top, you move from low adaptive capacity to high adaptive capacity. So those ecosystems that have low sensitivity and low exposure uh, and high adaptive capacity occur near that green bubble of low vulnerability in that upper left quadrant. Then if you have um, ecosystems with high sensitivity and high exposure and low adaptive capacity, you occur in that bottom right um, high vulnerability bubble. And so this figure and its orientation is just repeated for each of the three geographic subregions. So north, um, Sierra Nevada is in the upper right, Central is in the bottom left, and South is in the bottom right. Um, and so I just wanted to point out a couple um, of themes or, or outliers as part of this figure. I won't spend too much time on it. You can look at this figure um, in our final report if you're interested in exploring it more. Um, but one place I do want to direct your attention is to the Alpine subalpine ecosystem, um, which was the ecosystem judged to be more vulnerable than all the other systems, having a combination of moderate to high exposure and low to moderate adaptive capacity. And what you can also see is that the vulnerability of this system increases in the northern Sierra Nevada compared to the central and south. Uh, and this is due to changes in snowpack being um, more significant in the northern Sierra Nevada. 
The other ecosystem I want to point you to is the oak woodlands. So this ecosystem is considered to be the least vulnerable system, uh, and it has more of a low to moderate exposure, moderate to high sensitivity, and moderate to high adaptive capacity. Um, oak woodlands exhibit general resistance to short-term changes, and they have pretty high um, tolerance for varying soil types, temperature, and precipitation. Um, the vulnerability of oak woodlands was evaluated as actually being higher in the southern Sierra Nevada, and this was primarily due to the impacts of non-climate stressors, um, particularly land use and development. The remaining ecosystems that we looked at, so yellow pine mix conifer, um, red fir, sagebrush, chaparral, wet meadows, um, were all evaluated as being more moderate uh, in their vulnerability. So now we're going to shift to looking at the results summarized for species. Um, the figure orientation is the same. So in the upper right, we have the northern Sierra Nevada. In the bottom left, we have the central. And then the bottom right, we have the southern Sierra Nevada. And then again, low vulnerability occurs in that upper left quadrant and high vulnerability in the bottom right. Um, species vulnerabilities generally fell into one of two categories, um, more moderate. So these are things like blue oak, black oak, mountain quail, and fisher. Um, and then moderate to high. So these were sage grouse, um, martin, bighorn sheep, willow flycatcher, white bark pine, and red fir. And um, several of the species shifted from moderate vulnerability to more moderate to high vulnerability, uh, or vice versa, depending on um, subregional differences in exposure. So you can see some of those shifting around depending on um, where we are geographically in the Sierra Nevada. The red fir, willow flycatcher, and white bark pine um, were the outlier species having the highest vulnerability of those that we looked at. Um, for example, red fir and willow flycatcher were two species um, that we looked at that occur in higher elevations and are particularly sensitive to changes in hydrology. So in the case of red fir, um, changes in snowpack and soil moisture affect the species directly, which really increases vulnerability. And in the case of willow flycatcher, it's the changes in water supply that affect wet meadows, um, which affects the species in turn. The vulnerability of a number of these species, um, particularly blue oak, black oak, fisher, and mountain quail, really stayed moderate throughout and didn't, didn't change um, or vary geographically. So just wanted to provide an idea of the kinds of products that have come out of this. Um, we have three main products. The first is this workshop support page. Um, and everything's available at the link that I've included at the bottom of the page here. And we will be sending out a PDF of the presentation um, later so you can access this. Uh, the workshop support page contains all of the materials from the workshop, including the presentations, handouts, recommended readings, and other content. Um, we have a final vulnerability assessment report, um, which describes how the focal resources were selected. Um, it talks about the vulnerability assessment model that we used and how it was applied um, in this project. And then we have the findings from the vulnerability assessment. Um, we actually have two different ways that the vulnerability assessment findings were summarized for focal resources. Um, the first are these full syntheses, which are anywhere from 8 to 20 pages in length. Um, the syntheses are comprised of information from the workshop, from the peer review literature, and from expert comments when we sent them out for review. Um, these full syntheses were the original deliverable that were described in our grant to the California LCC. Um, and as a result, these are the findings that are provided in that overall vulnerability assessment report. The purpose behind these syntheses was to provide transparency for all of the information that was collected as part of this process. Um, and the intended audience is really scientists or others who want a more detailed understanding um, of what, what the process was all about and, and how the information and findings were compiled. Um, while these full syntheses are included in that full report, you can um, download them as standalone documents. Again, at that link that's included at the bottom of the slide. Um, we we're also able to uh, create these shorter three to five page um, vulnerability assessment briefings. Um, the briefings were not originally included in our California LCC grant, but through additional funding from the LCC and from the Forest Service, we we're able to create these shorter documents. Um, these are shorter synopses that highlight the key sensitivity, adaptive capacity, and exposure factors for each local resource. Um, and the purpose is really just to summarize the key vulnerability assessment um, findings. And the audience was really for land and resource managers, so they could get that vulnerability information they need more quickly. 
Um, and these are available for, down, for download as standalone documents. They're not included in that full report, but you can get them as standalone documents on that link. So now shifting gears a little bit, I want to talk about how the vulnerability assessment results um, were applied during our adaptation workshop. As I mentioned earlier, the purpose of doing a vulnerability assessment is to identify why resources are vulnerable. And so it's really important um, because then you can start to identify adaptation strategies um, that reduce vulnerabilities. So specifically, you want to identify ways to reduce sensitivity, reduce exposure, or enhance adaptive capacity. So an example of reducing sensitivity might be something like actively planting drought tolerance species in an area that's likely to get drier. An example of reducing exposure might be something like replanting riparian vegetation in order to limit stream temperature increases. And then an example of enhancing adaptive capacity might be something like supporting connectivity across the landscape so that different populations can move and shift as conditions change. So in terms of the adaptation strategy process that we undertook, it was really um, comprised of four main steps again. Um, the figure on the right is, um, mimics the steps that are listed on the left. So the vulnerability assessment information um, was assembled and then provided to participants during an adaptation planning workshop, which was held in June of 2013. Um, following that workshop, we compiled and synthesized the adaptation strategies um, into a report, which was then sent out for peer review um, and comments and revisions incorporated into our final adaptation report. And I'll go into more detail. Um, on the workshop here in just one second. So during the adaptation workshop, um, we had participants, again, break out into groups based on area of expertise. We had over 30 participants representing approximately 20 different agencies, NGOs, and environmental groups. Um, it was a shorter workshop than our vulnerability one. Um, our vulnerability assessment workshop was two and a half days, and this was only a day and a half. Um, and within um, each of the breakout groups, we had um, the teams work together to first develop uh, management goals for at least one focal resource. They were then asked to evaluate their management goal feasibility um, using the vulnerability assessment findings. They then were asked to generate a suite of adaptation approaches and actions for a given focal resource and then to identify the feasibility of implementing those actions. Lastly, we asked them to begin to identify resources needed to move forward with implementation of those adaptation actions. Um, so during this workshop, participants were, were able to develop adaptation strategies um, and actions for the focal resources that are listed there on the upper right. Um, I just want to emphasize that developing adaptation strategies takes a lot more time um, and energy than it does conducting a vulnerability assessment. Um, and we had, um, based on participant expertise and the number of people that attended this workshop, this is what we were able to assess. Uh, but we did get some really great information um, for these local resources. So um, I would encourage you to take a look at the final report. Um, so again, following these small breakout group exercises, we had the group reconvene, um, and each group shared their findings with a larger group in order to begin identifying some common adaptation themes. So where were we seeing overlap in some of the adaptation approaches and actions that were recommended? Where are we seeing um, potentials for collaboration or potential um, similar barriers to implementation, things like that. Um, so this just provided an opportunity for people to start to share and get ideas um, of how we might start to think about implementing some of these actions. So again, I want to provide you with an example of what the findings look like um, for wet meadows. So this is um, from one of the adaptation tables that are in our final report. Um, just to quickly orient you, on the left-hand column, we have um, a more general adaptation approach that the group identified. The middle column are more specific or strategic actions you could take under that approach. And then the right-hand column is the rationale. So why would you want to undertake this approach? Uh, so if we look in the upper left box, um, one of the adaptation approaches that the Wet Meadows group identified was to restore floodplain function, um, as this approach helps to limit impact from projected climate changes, including things like increased drought, reduced soil moisture, and altered flow regimes. Some of the strategic actions that the group identified included things like establishing setbacks, um, restoring soils and structure, and in-stream restoration. And the rationale behind um, this approach and these actions is that the knowledge, infrastructure, and funding already exist. Um, it's a proven method. People are familiar and comfortable with it and feel like they can be successful at it. So it's 
is a good adaptation approach to continue doing. Um, but what the group did note is that the current pace and scale of these kinds of restoration activities isn't sufficient to deal with potential climate in, impacts. So we really need to increase um, our efforts and funding for these kinds of activities in order to keep pace with um, potential climate changes. I mentioned earlier that we also asked the group um, to identify the feasibility of implementing the approach. So um, we asked them to think about whether or not the action was capable of being implemented and how effective it would be. So those boxes that are highlighted in green on here were thought to have high feasibility, so high, high likelihood of being implemented and high effectiveness. And those boxes that are highlighted in yellow were thought to have more moderate um, feasibility. So what you can see is that bottom row of the table um, for the adaptation approach around reducing the negative impacts of recreation roads and trails. Um, this was thought to have more moderate feasibility. Um, and this is just because people rely on roads and trails um, for recreation access. And it may be difficult to change standards um, around this, particularly if people are accustomed to having these trails and roads already open and then taking them away might take a little bit of um, a little bit of um, public education and outreach around that and encouragement and understanding as to why why that needs to happen um, in order to preserve these meadows for the future. So again, a couple of products that have come out of um, this piece of the project. Again, a workshop support page, which is available at the link below. Um, contains all the materials from the workshop, including the presentation handouts um, and recommended readings. And then we have the final report. So the report is comprised of information from the workshop. Um, we also supplemented the adaptation strategies um, and actions that the groups identified with some from the peer review literature. So those are included in the final report as well. Um, and this also has uh, comments and revisions from reviewers incorporated. So again, I wanted to think about how you might apply these kinds of adaptation strategies in management decision making. And this is, again, in the context of forest plan revisions. Um, and the second example is around designing alternative management strategies. So this box that I have on the left is from um, another forest plan, again, outside of this year in Nevada. Um, and it's around maintaining water quality. So the current management strategies are to maintain water quality and to minimize the sediment that is generated and delivered to water courses from active livestock grazing allotments. The grazing activity should locate new livestock handling and or management facilities out of resource conservation areas, locate salting efforts out of resource conservation areas, and harden or relocate trailing stream crossings or approaches. So, um, adaptation strategies can be integrated or identified as alternative management strategies in a couple of ways. One is to sort of add them in to these existing bullet points um, or to create a new bullet point altogether. Um, so that's what I've done here in this box on the right, um, where I've taken the existing bullet point around locating new livestock handling and our management facilities out of resource conservation areas. Um, we might also want to consider locating these handling facilities out of areas that are projected to experience increased flood risk, landslides, or erosion due to climate change. So if our goal is really um, to maintain water quality and to minimize sediment delivery, we probably don't want to have livestock handling facilities in areas that are likely to have increased erosion because they're likely to experience either increased precipitation events um, or things like shift from rain to snow um, and, and um, just really changing um, the water delivery to those systems. Uh, another uh, adaptation strategy that we can consider incorporating here is around grazing intensity and timing. So we could have an alternative management strategy that says we want to limit grazing intensity and timing during seasons projected to experience increased precipitation. So for example, during winter and spring in the Sierra Nevada. Um, grazing can increase runoff and erosion following rain events. Um, so we probably don't want to have um, high intensity uh, grazing during during these seasons um, that that increased precipitation could occur. So again, just sort of wanted to bring this back into how you might start to incorporate both vulnerability and, and adaptation information in these kinds of um, management planning efforts. So the last bit that I want to talk about as part of this project is around climate informed mapping. Um, this was something that we incorporated a bit into the adaptation workshop that we held in June of 2013. And so we didn't get to do as much with it as I would have liked. Um, but I did want to present 
the information that was gathered and, and how you might consider using it so that people can continue um, to apply this information. So um, information from the vulnerability assessment as well as any uh, stakeholder um, engagement process that was led as part of that vulnerability assessment workshop was used to identify and gather key climate and non-climate spatial data sets for a given resource. Um, and then we're used to create maps. So if you look at this um, series of maps that I have here, the map on the left um, is the current meadow distribution within the Sierra Nevada. The map in the middle is um, projected changes in groundwater recharge for the northern Sierra Nevada. And then the map on the right is around um, current livestock grazing allotments in the Sierra Nevada. Um, so what we did is pull together these different um, climate and non-climate spatial data sets in order to generate these climate-informed maps. And the maps are intended to help improve understanding about where and why a resource may be vulnerable and what kinds of adaptation actions may be most appropriate to implement given those vulnerabilities. So I'm going to walk you through a couple of different examples of how you might apply this kind of spatial information. So again, just to orient you, this is a zoomed in um, version of meadows in the northern Sierra Nevada. Um, meadows are the sort of randomly placed dark purple splotches. Um, the areas outlined in red are the current livestock grazing allotments. And then the areas that go from dark teal to the lighter cream or tan um, are areas of projected groundwater recharge by 2070. So, the areas in dark teal are likely to either maintain current groundwater recharge or potentially increase in groundwater recharge by 2070. And then the areas that are in the cream or tan are likely to um, significantly decline in terms of groundwater recharge by 2070. So I've just highlighted a couple of different areas here. So these are um, current wet meadows that occur within livestock grazing allotments. Um, and are projected to lose um, significant groundwater recharge by 2070. So you can start to think about the kinds of adaptation actions you might want to implement or consider implementing um, given the suite of conditions in this area. So this could um, include something like installing grazing exposures or removing current allotments to help keep what water is there in the system. Um, similarly, we could consider establishing seasonal grazing restrictions so perhaps we want to avoid grazing during the driest times of the year, again, in order to keep what water is there in the system for the vegetation and wildlife that depends on those wet meadows. We could also think about um, implementing monitoring plans, um, first to determine if water supply or groundwater recharge is in fact declining, and then if it is, um, also monitoring biological diversity to look at potential impacts. Um, lastly, we could think about um, more targeted restoration activities in these areas. So if these are meadows that have particularly high biological value or they contain threatened and endangered species, maybe they're really important for a willow flycatcher and we really want to preserve these meadows, um, these may be places where we really want to um, implement more targeted restoration activities in order to help keep water in the system. Um, I did want to note that the actions that I'm listing here are all of those that were identified by the Wet Meadows group and are in those um, adaptation tables that I showed earlier. So I'm just trying to sort of tie this all together, how you might use um, sort of these concepts that we identify, how you might think about applying them um, on the landscape when you use it in combination um, with spatial information. So um, the next place that I've circled are wet meadows that occur within um, current livestock grazing allotments that are likely to either maintain or even increase in water supply or groundwater recharge in the future. Um, so some of the kinds of adaptation actions that we could think about implementing in these areas uh, might be managing to reduce grazing impacts um, by maintaining fencing, providing off-channel water and minerals, um, or reducing other kinds of non-climate stressors in order to keep these meadows as viable as possible. Um, similarly, we could consider closing grazing allotments um, or limiting grazing intensity or density in areas of high biological value. So perhaps we want to think about more active cattle management through rotation so that we limit the negative effects on ecosystem structure and function. Again, trying to keep these as viable as possible. Um, and then lastly, um, these meadows may be potential refugia in the, in the future, so it could be a place that we really want to think about um, implementing more uh, protective measures, uh, particularly from other non-climate stressors. 
So again, just wanted to sort of give you an idea of the kinds, how you might think about implementing adaptation actions um, or where you might think about implementing them on the landscape. Um, I did want to mention that it's really going to be important for you as a resource or land manager to be very clear about what your goal is for that particular resource or for your particular landscape because that's really going to help you to identify and prioritize the adaptation actions and approaches that you want to take. Um, you could potentially, again, do restoration activities in these areas if you really want to keep these as resilient as possible instead of prioritizing restoration in areas likely to lose that water supply. So again, really depends on what your goal is for that resource or for your particular landscape. Um, that's really going to help you figure out what kinds of adaptation actions um, to implement. So the climate-informed maps and all of the spatial data has been assembled on database. Uh, if uh, you can find it through searching this group name that I've included here in blue, or you can find it through the link at the bottom of this slide. So again, all of the spatial and non, or all of the spatial climate and non-climate data sets are available on database. So we have um, downscaled spatial climate data to 270 meters for the entire Sierra Nevada for temperature, precipitation, snowpack, groundwater recharge, runoff, um, wildfire, and vegetation change. So that's all available. Um, and again, just want to reiterate that the maps can help you to identify where and why resources may be vulnerable, the magnitude of change they're likely to experience, and what kinds of adaptation strategies may be appropriate um, given impacts. But again, it really is going to be dependent on what your goal is for the particular resource or for your landscape. Um, lastly, because there's so many products that have come out as part of this, um, I just wanted to include this Sierra Nevada Quick Start Guide if you do go back to this presentation later. Um, if you're quite new to climate change um, and looking for more of an introduction to climate change and adaptation planning in the Sierra Nevada, we recommend that you start with the second section of the Vulnerability Assessment Report and then go back to um, the future climate change projections. If you're looking for more specific climate change vulnerability assessment information, we recommend you go straight to that vulnerability assessment report. Um, if you're look, looking to integrate climate change into existing management activities, we recommend you start with the climate change adaptation strategies report. And again, if you want that spatial climate data and information, um, you can get that through database. So this is sort of more of a resource for later. Uh, and at this point, I think I'm going to turn it back over to Chrissy to talk about the broader impacts of the project and its application. Hi. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, actually, somebody just stuck their head in the door here. <laughs> um, all right. So um, yeah, the climate change scorecard I'll talk about in the next slide, but I wanted to also touch on some of the broader impacts of this project. So. This project has had implications for the bioregional assessment um, for the early adopter forest going through forest plan revision. So um, while these final products came out in February or March, um, throughout the process we have been tying in with the regional office, with the planning staff, so that this information can get incorporated. I know that was a concern of stakeholders as well as folks on the forest. So just continually trying to pull in that information and make it available. And then um, outside of our region, in Region 1, they have been using this um, same approach. Um, and so this, this project actually had implications there as well as up in Region 10 with the Tongass. And um, the Gulf of the Farallons Marine Sanctuary has followed um, many of the same steps that we've used with this project. So it's really great to see it having such a beneficial impact in, in a number of ways. Um, the next slide gets at um, the scorecard. So as I mentioned earlier, there are two elements that really relate directly to this. Element six, assessing vulnerability, and element seven, adaptation actions. And then I, I didn't mention this, but there are two other uh, scorecard elements, science and management partnerships, as well as other partnerships. So um, the work on this project has really helped move the forest to yes, in, if, if they weren't already, in relation to those four different elements. And for element six, 
we saw an increase from 47% of the units reporting yes in fiscal year 12 to 56% and in fiscal year 13. And with element 7, we moved from 76% saying yes in fiscal year 12 to 94% in fiscal year 13. And I've made this little bullet point about the units that reported no. So as part of the scorecard reporting, there's a narrative. And a number of the forests that reported no that were outside of the Sierra Nevada area, which is the geography that this encompassed, indicated that they'd really like to see something similar happen in their own geography. And indeed, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but we will be following up with um, the Southern California forest to repeat this process down there. Um, so we've been really pleased with the process. We've learned a lot, and, and as, we, as this gets implemented in other locations, we've also given suggestions on you know, how we would tweak it or do things a little bit differently. Um, and we feel really good about the fact that this has just been a continuously an adaptive process that we've all learned a lot from. So next slide. Turn it back over to Jesse. Thanks, Christy. Um, so, just briefly wanted to talk about um, next steps for um, this project and beyond and for the remainder of 2014. So, the first um, are these targeted agency trainings, which we'll be holding in fall of 2014, likely October. So, we will be leading a series of um, intensive, we're saying one day trainings, but really they'll be anywhere from four to six hours. Um, in each of these three geographic subregions, North Central and South Sierra Nevada, um, during which time we want to meet with Forest Service staff at regional or local offices to present the project results if they're not already familiar with them, uh, and then work with staff to apply the information in their management decision-making processes. So really working with them um, if they need help with designing draft plan components or um, feeding into some sort of resource conservation strategy or monitoring framework. Um, basically, just working um, with resource managers to help integrate and think about how they can use this kind of information um, in their um, management decision making. The second step that we have is this tailored product development piece. Um, we've already developed these uh, resource vulnerability assessment briefings. Um, but we're going to also be developing a series of vulnerability and adaptation briefs, which are actually going to be even shorter. They're going to be um, two pages um, for each resource. So on the first side, we were going to do vulnerability assessment information, and then on the second side, do um, adaptation actions that could be taken to reduce those vulnerabilities. So we're in the process of developing those right now. Um, and then we've been talking with folks about other potential tailored products, um, one of which was around public uh, outreach and engagement. So working to improve um, outreach around um, potential climate change impacts on forests or forest resources, and then um, thinking about the kinds of adaptation strategies that the forest might be undertaking to address, um, again, those resource vulnerabilities. So um, we're totally open to ideas if folks on this call have thoughts on what kinds of um, more specific or tailored products would be really useful to you. Um, always open to thoughts and ideas, so definitely share those if you've got some. Um, and then lastly is this um, Southern California forest piece. So as Chrissy alluded to, um, we're going to be expanding this uh, methodology into Southern California. So we're going to be working with uh, the Forest Southern California National Forest um, through fall of 2014 and into 2015. Uh, applying a similar process and spending a bit more time and emphasis on the adaptation planning piece. So we're really excited to get to get started and going on that um, later later this year. Um, and then lastly, just wanted to thank our funders, the California LCC, the Forest Service, and the Yale Mapping Framework for allowing us to do this work. Um, and a big thank you to our partners, very much the Forest Service, um, but also the GS Institute, the Conservation Biology Institute, and TACMO. So at this point, I think we're going to open it up to what we're calling our office hours or questions. Um, we can stick around for the full hour if there's a lot of questions that folks have. Um, otherwise, we'll just do a normal Q&A. Um, but we'll open it up to questions about the presentation itself, um, any kinds of suggestions on process for the Southern California Forest, 
um, or more specific questions about climate issues uh, on here for us. So I believe we're asking folks to write in their questions um, in the question box of their GoTo webinar panel, um, or you can raise your hand um, and we can unmute you, but we won't unmute everybody for the sake of being able to hear. But thank you. Thanks, thanks Jesse. And um, while folks are thinking about any questions they might have, I just wanted to add in with the, that uh, work that we're proposing to do in Southern California. So just about two weeks ago, we found out that um, the California Landscape Conservation Cooperative will be funding part of that work. So we're um, excited to have them involved again, since they've been so instrumental with the project in this year in Nevada and with other projects happening throughout the state and um, various geographies. Um, we're really excited that they um, are, are going to fund um, part of that work and that they're supporting it. So Whitney, do we have any questions? We have one comment. Michael Kellett noted that the table of strategic action for wet meadows did not include beaver reintroduction. And this could be a critical omission given the recent publications indicating that the historic distribution of beaver included most of California. Great. I can probably address that. <laughs> um, that, so Michael, thank you for your comments. Um, that's a great comment. And I actually, that was just a snapshot of one of the, or three, I guess, of the um, different rows of that table, but there's multiple others. And I'm almost certain that beaver is part of that. And if it's not, then it is an omission. It may not have been something that participants recommended, but it should have been something we added from the peer-reviewed literature. But I will double check that, because if it's not, we will need to add it in. 